So um, let's go ahead and get started with today's program. I have Garrick Taylor with me. And Garrick, and in fact, it's funny because Garrick is now the interim um, um, CEO for the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But um, up until earlier this week, he served as the um, executive VP for the Arizona Chamber and leads the Chamber's advocacy um, efforts at all levels of government and the main liaison between the Chamber and the media. Garrick's previous experience includes serving as a public affairs accountant, direct communications for the Arizona Republican Party during a U.S. Senate race, and overseeing public policy efforts for a major trade organization, as well as serving as a congressional staff member. So he really has that depth of, of the full range of our political um, realm here. In his time at the chamber, Garrick has worked significantly on legislation in areas as tax, tort reform, health care, regulatory, and many, many more, as well as several political campaigns and ballot measures impacting Arizona's employers. He is a graduate of ASU, and he is a Chandler resident. So Garrick, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Terry, and good morning from 85226 today. <laughs> well, and Garrick, before we get started um, and start talking about policy, I want to ask you just a couple of questions for everybody that's on today's call. Um, I just want to, um, can you start off in talking a little bit about the makeup of the legislature this year? Um, because I think that helps to set the tone of some of the issues that we're going to talk about moving forward. Yeah, sure, Terry. And thanks for the for the invite. You know, the Arizona Chamber loves to partner with the Chandler Chamber. You and I have been doing this conversation for several years now. We'll let some <laughs> somebody else keep track, but you and I have been doing this conversation for some time now. Um, Terry, we are in the 55th state legislature, and we started the first session last month. So that means we're coming out of an election in the fall, as we all know. Uh, we went in uh, to the election with Republicans having the majority in both the state Senate and the state House. In the state House, it was 31-29 in the Republican advantage. We came out of the election with the same margin, 31-29. Uh, a Republican legislator, an incumbent, lost his seat, but so did a Democrat, and she was replaced with a Republican. So the margin stayed the same. Um, now, in the state Senate, going into the election, the margin was 17-13 in favor of the Republicans. Uh, a, an incumbent state senator from North Central Phoenix, she lost her general election was replaced by a Democrat. So now we're at a 16-14 Republican advantage. Now, two points on that, Terry. Uh, that outcome in some ways went against conventional wisdom. I think that there was an emerging, or at least it had emerged over the course of last year, that control of one or both houses of the legislature would switch partisan control. And that didn't happen. Uh, now, what didn't change, though, is the margins still remain very narrow, and that means in each legislative chamber, if you lose one vote, you're at a tie and the bill doesn't pass. So there's two things that could mean, Terry. Either you have to have extreme caucus discipline, meaning everybody has got to be on the same page all the time, or you've got to try to find issues that can attract uh, bipartisan support and get Republicans and Democrats to advance a measure. Now, I, I guess, Terry, it will depend on the issue at hand. We've already seen uh, some issues where there was an expectation that a bill that was going to be voted on was going to have uh, party line support, and it didn't. And mm -hmm. I know that causes a headache for legislative leadership. So. We're about six weeks in, and uh, I think some folks are still getting their sea legs. <laughs> I think that's an understatement because have we we've hit over seventeen hundred bills or close to seventeen hundred bills down there already? Yeah, yeah, it's it's it, it's a lot, and 
I don't know, Terry, if I were king for a day, I might put a limit on the number of these bills that get introduced <laughs> because it puts a big strain on staff who uh, are responsible for writing these measures and tracking them through the process. Now we are getting a, a kind of a, an inflection point because next week will be the last week that bills can be heard in the chamber that they originated in. Uh, and then they get passed by their full house or Senate and then get passed over to the next to the next entity. So we're starting to weed some of this stuff out, but there, there's always uh, tools in the toolbox to bring a measure back from the dead. So stay tuned. Well, and I know that the Arizona Chamber puts out their legislative priorities as well as the Chandler Chamber. Yeah. Sometimes we agree, um, for, um, but sometimes we there are other things as well that we have on our agenda that may not be of relevance at the state level. Can sure. you talk a little bit about what some of the state chamber priorities are? Yeah, sure. How about we do this? I'll, I'll put them in three broad themes and then you can drill down if you like. I think the first one is uh, where there is crossover between the state chamber and a metro chamber like yours or any level, mm -hmm. and that's COVID recovery. Absolutely. Um, and um, look, I, I can't go down to the legislature and lobby for everyone to get a vaccination, but that's critically important. As you know, to get this, this economy uh, open in a much more robust way, uh, our businesses have to feel comfortable to have workers back at the on-site workplace. Customers have to feel comfortable going back. Terry, I think the, uh, the rollout of the vaccine is critical in that regard. Mm -hmm. Now, we've all heard it. We've heard the grousing and the complaints about the online registration system. But, and I'm not trying to spin you with a glass half full, but just this week, we hit a million vaccinations in Arizona. And I think that's something to... That is something to cheer. And you're hearing reports even from the CDC that by the time we get to April, it could become one come all, that the supply will catch up with the, with the demand. So that is, um, that is, that's a critical element of our recovery. It doesn't have a neat le legislative solution. This is something that we've just got to get done. And it's a, it's a combination of medical ingenuity and, and uh, logistics expertise, but things seem to be going better now than they were just a week ago. So the fact that they're getting better every day is, is a real encouragement. That is uh, an encouragement. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and look, but when we talk about a COVID recovery, we're also talking about an economic recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear from small and medium-sized businesses all the time that are uh, hanging on by a thread mm -hmm. that for whom the PPP program was a literal lifeline. Um, you also probably have met one-time members of the chamber who weren't able to continue their membership because uh, things really bottomed out last year. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you have plenty of stories about that. And so we want to make sure that we keep the economy as competitive as possible. And that includes uh, looking at opportunities for tax reform. Our small businesses, unfortunately, as a result of passage of a ballot measure last fall, have some of the highest income tax rates in the country. Arizona is now a, you know, one of the top 10 highest uh, state income tax rates at 8% because of passage of a proposition last fall. Um, that's a real concern in a soft economy, in a wobbly economy where we're trying to get folks back. There are other elements of tax reform though, Terry, that include property tax reform. There's a desire to lower the assessment ratio. I know you've got big investments in Chandler and your property owners are extremely sensitive to Arizona's property tax system. So that's something to, to watch. And then one more, more point on COVID recovery, that's liability reform. A lot of businesses are very concerned that as they get back to work, welcome more people back in stores and restaurants, welcome workers back to the work site, that they could be uh, inviting uh, the, uh, the interest of an enterprising trial lawyer who wants to hit him with the COVID exposure lawsuit. Uh, the chamber is supporting this year a, a really strong COVID liability protection bill. It's got over 80 signers onto a coalition. I know that local chambers across the East Valley, including the Chandler Chamber, are, are supportive of that. 
And uh, Terry, I just want to be clear. We're not talking about blanket immunity. We're not talking about giving bad actors a free pass. We are talking, though, about giving businesses some measure of confidence that they're not going to get whacked with a lawsuit for going back to, for going back to work. And uh, Terry, this is targeted. It's temporary. It's ref it reflects the needs at this time. And it's a unique time. I'll hit you with two more real quick. Bucket number two, protecting the citizen initiative system. You and I have had this conversation over the years. And it's just too easy to get a destructive measure onto the Arizona ballot. And if there's a negative unintended consequence, unintended, there's nothing we can do about it. The legislature can't fix it. Now you gotta go back to the ballot. We really need to think, Terry, I think about how open we wanna to be to out-of-state interests bringing their ideas here. So there's a few measures that are kicking around at the Capitol. Uh, I won't speculate on what's gonna pass, but a few ideas. Um, one would be that signature gatherers on petitions, they need to get signatures from a broader uh, representation of the state. You see it. Uh, there's a lot of signature gatherings, a big deal in Metro Phoenix. But if you and I were to head to Navajo County, we're not going to see much. And the, the shame of that is, is that rural Arizona doesn't really get a say in what shows up on the ballot every fall. Another issue would be to raise the threshold of the votes that would need to be received in order to pass a ballot measure. If you want to amend the Constitution at the ballot in Florida, you got to get 60%. You want to pass a uh, measure at the ballot in Colorado, you got to get 55. In other states, you have to get some percentage of the number of ballots cast above 50%. Now, that might seem unusual when we're used to our simple majority system, but as we just said, in Arizona, once something's passed at the ballot, it's basically frozen in stone. So we have to ask whether we need to add more rigor around the system because going to the ballot is probably the most high stakes form of lawmaking. And there's also another idea that's kicking around that would limit the questions on the ballot to a single subject. If we were gonna run a bill at the legislature, we would have to constrain our proposal to one subject. But if you're trying to pass a statutory question at the ballot, you can put all sorts of stuff on there. I know that the Chandler Chamber was very sensitive to a proposed health care measure that had all sorts of new mandates on the health care industry. Uh, and, and the key point there, Terry, all sorts of things. It had everything on there. It was not constra constrained to one subject. So, so those are some reforms that are being discussed in the legislature. Those will have to go back to the ballot. And then finally, just last thing, we all care about strong educational outcomes and accountability. Absolutely. This is, we want, uh, regardless of zip code, everyone to get uh, access to a great education. The downside of Proposition 208, and, and there are many on the fiscal side, is just to keep in mind that that measure didn't say anything about academics. Uh, it didn't say anything about uh, 12th grade graduation and pre preparation for the workforce or higher ed. Didn't say anything about college attainment. So I think it's going to be on us in the business community to continue to be the voice for accountability in that in that sphere. So Terry, I threw a lot at you, but those are those are the three big themes. Well, and it's interesting that you brought up about the signatures. I know last year um, when I was coming out of the Phoenix Open, they had several people as I was walking to get on the bus that were, and of course, we all know that the Open, people like um, to consume beverages. <laughs> And some of the people coming out and they were just standing there, hey, you want to sign a petition, not saying what it was for or anything. Right. And we want our we want our voters to be educated on what they're voting on. That's the key thing. Let, let's help do that as well, as opposed to just gathering those signatures. Anybody can sign on, but they really need to understand what they're signing. It's a good point. You know, uh, Terry, when, you, when you're presented with those petitions, there's that 100 word description at the top. And that's supposed to tell you what the measure does, but boy, 100 words is, uh, it, it doesn't always tell the, the whole story, does it? And we just have to be extremely careful in Arizona when we go to the, when we go to the ballot. So let's talk a little bit about the revenue front um, from the COVID to just the overall budget. Can you, can you share some thoughts on that? You know, uh, when the governor delivered his state of the state address last month, uh, 
uh, he really focused on COVID recovery. And in some of the same ways that we're discussing here today, both from a health standpoint and from an economic standpoint. I think the governor recognizes that uh, the economy in Arizona, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to paint a negative picture. It's a strong economy, but for many businesses, small and medium, it's wobbly. It could go, it could go either way. Uh, here is the good news, though, in Arizona, that we went into this pandemic-induced downturn with a little over a billion dollars in the rainy day fund. Credit to the legislature and the governor for their prudent budgeting over the last several budget cycles. Look, they got some criticism for that, uh, for having that robust rainy day fund, because on the right, you might argue, well, that, that's an example of overtaxing your citizens if you have that much in the savings account. On the left, you might argue that, that those are dollars that are being squirreled away that would be better, better spent on some, um, some sort of maybe a social program or some other core government responsibility. So that was not an easy decision, but it looks like now it was the prudent one. If you look at national uh, prognostications, Terry, Arizona still looks really good for a swifter uh, pandemic, uh, a swifter recovery from the pandemic induced downturn. Um, I don't know what you're hearing from your colleagues across the, the valley and across the state, but I think uh, we would rather be in the position we are in Arizona than in some other states. There is still uh, a projection from both the executive and legislative branch that we will end this next fiscal year, this current fiscal year, and go into the next one with a healthy cash balance. And I would tell you that it, it, sometimes it makes for a tougher debate, but um, to have this debate over how to spend the money and where to make the investments, I'd rather have that conversation than where to make deep cuts. And Terry, one more point on this budgetary situation. You might have heard the governor say in his state of the state that when it comes to tax reform in 2021, let's go big. I think he believes that there's an opportunity there uh, for some smart reforms. We would agree with him and would, would like to work on that. So talk a little bit about what that looks like on the tax reform. You might, well, you might remember several years ago, this is during the Brewer administration, there were two big economic development and tax packages passed. And it was a big deal for Chandler because remember there was the sales factor um, provision in there. So for our big exporting companies that are selling out of state, it was competitive, uh, made the state more competitive for them. Uh, there was a um, reduction in the commercial property tax assessment ratio down to 18%. That was really encouraging. And I think, Terry, we're going to start revisiting those measures now. I think that there is a desire um, from our large property taxpayers that we need to, that there's room for improvement in the assessment ratio. I, look, again, you've got big commercial investments in your area. I know you hear this one all the time. So we, 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 could, we could do better there. And, and then it's this issue of the individual income tax. Um, our top rate is now 8%. As I said earlier, that's a top 10 highest in the, in the country. Uh, it's a real concern. And I am not here to make the case for the rich and famous. But as you and I both know, small businesses pay their taxes via the individual income tax. That's why we are so sensitive to this individual income tax rate. They don't pay the corporate income tax rate. Our corporate income tax rate, we're still quite competitive, 4.9%. That top 8% rate, it's, it is a real concern. Um, there's a 3.5% uh, surtax that was passed at the ballot last fall. Uh, I don't think that's going anywhere. It's being challenged in court on constitutionality reasons, but I don't believe that the legislature really has any has, has many options in front of it. So you'd have to now look, Terry, at how and whether to lower that base rate. And I think there is uh, a real appetite to do something like that. Now, it's still early. I don't want to speculate on what would be wrapped up in a final package, but keep in mind those two areas, the assessment ratio and the income tax rate. So, Garrick, I have another question. You know, um, how do we get our legislators down um, at the Capitol and that to come more together? 
Um, right now, you've had this situation between the legislature and Maricopa County supervisors. And, and again, not taking sides on any one of them. My concern is future attraction on economic development on recruiting companies here. Who's going to want to come to a, a, a state that we've got political people that are just fighting against one another. I don't want this to turn into another SB 1070 from a public relations standpoint is we want people to come here to Arizona. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, many, Terry. I'll tell you, it's a tough thing because, well, Terry, I bet you would rather spend your day courting companies and showing them some great places around Chandler rather than having to explain what's going on between the legislature and the board Mm -hmm. of supervisors. It's it's outside the uh, comfort zone for chambers like yours and mine. This is not the stuff that we we don't really like refereeing these food fights. We'd rather be attracting businesses to the state. And it's uh, it's not only difficult to explain, it is a it's an intra party battle, which is ugly. It's a battle across levels of government, which is disappointing. Terry, I just hope cooler heads prevail. It is an unnecessary distraction. It's already attracted some national media attention. Uh, you, You and I have both seen this show before on other topics. It's terribly distracting. You know, when we went through some of the immigration battles of many years ago, uh, there were calls for things like boycotts, for example. I- I'm not saying that's what's going to happen here, but you and I have seen the fallout of when when stuff hits national media. And, you know, a lot of conventions, it's not that they cancel. There weren't many that did. The problem, though, is that you never end up on the finalist list. You don't you don't, you, you just, you're not in the conversation. And yeah. we always want communities like Chandler to be in the conversation when it comes to, to new investments. And we don't want to be dismissed out of hand for what is believed to be a topsy-turvy political environment and an unpredictable one. Yeah. We've got a question here in the chat. Um, will the monies that the state garners from legalized marijuana help the tax reform? Maybe. Um, Terry, I think when you think about new revenue streams, that's one of them, is legalized marijuana. Now, full disclosure, our chamber uh, opposes the legalization of marijuana. We have a lot of employers who are just, I don't have to tell you, a lot of employers concerned about drugs mm-hmm. in the workplace. That, that's, just, that, that, um, that, that's just a fact that we had to deal with. I don't know what the revenue projections look like, and I approach this subject with some trepidation. Because in other states that have uh, legalized recreational marijuana, the revenues did not match the projections. And I think that there is some concern that if you are looking at legalized marijuana as a path to increase revenues, that you might be, uh, you, you might be chasing ghosts, that it's, just not, that it's just not there. We're in early days though, Terry, so I don't wanna dismiss it. I'm just saying that other states experience with revenues have been less than great. So let, let's see how this goes. But Terry, the other revenue area that, that could come to fruition in 2021 is this discussion of renewing the gaming compacts and updating the gaming compacts between the state and the tribes, but updating them to include sports game. Uh, there was some testimony this week from yeah. Arizona's major league teams from NHL, NBA, Major League Baseball, and the NFL went to the podium and said, we want this. And because the, the teams would get a, uh, a piece of the action. So you might look for that, Terry, as a revenue source on this modernized gaming compacts. There's also a bill at the legislator, legislature this session on updating some of the horse racing agreements. I don't know where that is headed, but there's a few things that are kicking around on the revenue front to keep an eye on. Great. Well, Garrick, I know we talked a lot about a lot. Anything else that you want to add? Well, look, let's uh, let's keep an eye on what's going on with our federal delegation. I know we uh, like to check in with the delegation from time to time. Early days of the Biden administration, but I think there's a real desire uh, in the administration to make some progress in the area of immigration. 
Uh, we would like the, the whole ball of wax. We would like a big reform package so that some of our high tech employers in Chandler have, a, have access to the H-1B program for high tech workers. That's difficult. I don't, you and I could spend another two hour seminar talking about that. But could we maybe get a permanent and sustainable solution for our DACA recipients and for our dreamers to shield them from deportation? Uh, Terry, when you're aiming for a 3% economic growth rate nationally, you can't do that when, you're, uh, when your uh, population rate is shrinking. So we need to think about growth in a smart way, the demographic challenges that this country is, is, is facing. So uh, maybe a chance for some progress on, on DACA this year. Well, and obviously workforce is a key issue, higher ed education in general, especially higher education, and that, that trained, talented workforce is critical here in Chandler. So and, um, and we're, we're supporting the, the new economy initiative that our Board of Regents pushing. I know it's a big deal for Chambers of Valley in the state. It is. So, well, thank you again, Garrick. You are always a fountain of knowledge. And I know this today's was a little bit different, but I really thought it was important to have that conversation. And um, as opposed to um, just seeing some, some traditional slides. So I want to thank you for that. Um, Elin, I am going to turn the mic back over to you because we know that water is a huge issue, not only here for Chandler, but for Arizona as a whole. And I can't wait to hear what Ron has to tell us. Thank you, Terry. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, presenting Ron Flawiter. He's a principal at the Salt River Project where he's responsible for managing projects that improve SRP's water system. Ron's projects focus on ensuring the future resiliency of SRP's water supply system by evaluating infrastructure and operational changes needed to meet the needs of Central Arizona under changing climate conditions. Ron served as a senior policy advisor to the commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation from 2018 to 2020 before returning to SRP. Ron has worked on water and power resource management throughout his career, starting in academic research for the climate assessment for the Southwest at the, Arizona, at, the, at the University of Arizona before working at SRP and the Bureau of Reclamation. Ron has a bachelor's degree in economics and mathematics from Northern Arizona University and a master's degree um, in applied economics from the University of Arizona. Ron is an Arizona native and grew up swimming in the canals and irrigation ponds in the Verde Valley that are fed by, by the Verde River. Welcome, Ron, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Helen, and, and thank you all for having me today. Um, I hope you can see my screen and hear me just fine. Um, I have really three themes that if I do my job correctly today, you'll, you'll come away thinking about them and understanding why they're so critical to reliable um, and consistent water management in Arizona. And those three themes are one, reliability. Um, two, partnership, and three, investment. Um, specifically with reliability, the importance of diverse portfolios in terms of water supplies, and the ability to actually capture and carry over that, that water in storage um, when it's available. Um, this is especially important when we're looking forward to expected climate change impacts of the region, and I'll talk a lot more about that in detail. In terms of partnerships, uh, Water is often quoted, a, a, and everyone's heard this uh, quote, um, water's for fighting, whiskey's for drinking. Um, I posit something slightly different, which is really, we move nowhere in water management without strong partnerships and relationships. And specific to uh, SRP's water system, and really Arizona's water system, is strong partnerships with the federal government, who own most of the major water infrastructure in, in central Arizona. And the last is investment. The reason we're able to live in the desert in this beautiful climate, though very uh, challenging at times, especially when it's hot and dry for, for a long period of time during drought times, imp uh, the importance of investment uh, can't be understated. 
especially when we're talking about our water infrastructure. We have to be thinking forward about what the future looks like in terms of supply and demand. And we also have to be thinking about what we need to close the gap in terms of any shortages. And investment is a critical piece of that. And one of the key parts of my talk today will be the amount of time that it actually takes to make these infrastructure investments come to fruition. Um, and that's why we really have to be talking about these things when we're not on the cusp of uh, of a uh, disaster, but we're, when we're in a, a great position, which we currently are in, in central Arizona in terms of our water supply. So again, those three themes are reliability, partnership and investment. And that's exactly what I'll be talking about today. Um, but just to start off, I'm gonna give you an overview of SRP's water system and, and the interconnectedness of central Arizona's water systems in general. And then I'm gonna focus in on a specific issue that we're facing on SRP system right now. But what I like to start with is the green infrastructure. Um, this is what, uh, what is called a watershed. Um, and specifically SRP has uh, two major watersheds that we're most um, focused on because that's where our water supplies come from. So SRP manages a series of dams, reservoirs and canals uh, to deliver water to the valley. And the water supplies come from the Salt and Verde rivers. Um, this map here, and you can see the key here that, that shows just how big the, these watersheds are. They're 13,000 square miles in total, take up a very large portion of central and northern Arizona. Um, they cover about 13,000 square miles, about 6,500 square miles each. And they collect the snow, the rain, the runoff on the land channeling it into the river system and make, and then you know through gravity making its way downstream towards the valley. Well, we're able to capture that water as it runs off, especially during the wetter, uh, cooler winter and spring months and capture it on a reservoir system and then manage it um, downstream. Uh, another piece of our system is that we have a robust groundwater system. So there's an aquifer that we're all standing on right now if you're in the valley that is very robust. And um, SRP has more than 270 groundwater wells that were able to pull water out of the ground when needed. So this, I think, shows a, a, a kind of that critical diversity piece I was talking to before. We have two river systems um, that cover a very large land mass in north and, uh, northern um, and central Arizona that are able to capture the diverse and often extreme rain and snow events that we see across northern Arizona. Sometimes you'll see storms go right across the Verde watershed and miss the salt. Other times you'll see them go across the salt and totally miss the Verde. And so having this diversity of land where the, the water and precipitation comes from is really critical in terms of, of diversity and reliability. Um, another key aspect of this is storage and really the infrastructure that enables storage of those water supplies. So if you've been in Arizona for more than one year, and especially if you've been in Arizona over the last year, we have a very, uh, a, a very diverse uh, precipitation patterns. Um, generally, we can rely on uh, winter months being when the majority of our, our water supplies come to the valley. Uh, they come primarily from snowpack across the Mogollon Rim, up towards Flagstaff and the Grand Canyon, and out towards the White Mountains, uh, Sholo Pine Top area. Um, but these uh, precipitation and snow uh, pack events can vary widely from year to year. In fact, last year we had so much uh, precipitation on the watersheds that we were actually spilling water. There was more water coming into our system than we could actually put to use or store. So we ended up spilling it downstream. Um, this year, in contrast, you might have remembered uh, last summer, the uh, sort, I think we're calling it the non-soon, not the monsoon, because we really didn't see a monsoon season. We saw next to no summer runoff. It was one of the hottest, driest summers on record in Phoenix. And this, that trend has continued through the fall and winter so far. We're, we're pretty far behind just median inflows into our system because we're seeing such a dry event. Um, and the reason I highlight this is because our system is exactly set up to handle that. Um, when farmers and settlers moved to the Salt River Valley back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, they saw a lot of the similar reasons that we all live here today. It's, it's a great climate, it's a beautiful environment, but one of the biggest challenges they had was this Salt River. 
you know, one year it would be a, a raging torrent that would rush through town, wash out uh, low bridges, wash out uh, irrigation, irrigation diversion works. Um, and then the next year it would be nothing but a trickle by midsummer. And so they would have this sort of feast or famine um, uh, sort of um, experience with the river. And so that's when the, the settlers of the Salt River Valley lobbied Congress to uh, authorize the Salt River Project which was really to build Theodore Roosevelt Dam up on the Salt River. And that piece of infrastructure that there was foresight um, and coordination to build is really the sort of the crown jewel or the, the keystone of what um, has enabled good water management in Arizona since the early 1900s. So over time, um, SRP in coordination with local partners and the federal government has continued that theme of investment on the Salt and Verde Rivers. Um, so much so that we went from one dam and reservoir at Theodore Roosevelt to six, four of them being on the Salt River and two of them on the Verde. Um, we also built and lined cement canals throughout the valley. So you can see these dark blue lines are the canals that it, I'm sure that many of you on, on the call today are familiar with seeing as you drive around town. And that enables us to move water from the diversion point right near Red Mountain on the Salt River um, to areas throughout the city. And originally this yellow area that you see here, which is SRP's water service area, primarily served agricultural lands. But as we've seen more and more uh, economic development and uh, population moving to Arizona, these lands are now very much urbanized and they're the Phoenix metropolitan area, kind of the core of it. Um, you can see we serve uh, valley cities, um, Mesa, Gilbert, Chandler, of course, Tempe, Phoenix, Glendale, Scottsdale, Tolleson, some parts of Peoria, Avondale. Um, and so we do make deliveries to agricultural lands today, but about 95% uh, and counting of the lands are now urbanized. They're uh, businesses, industrial parks, they're homes, they're the communities that we all live in. Um, and so many of the deliveries that we see today through these canals are going to water treatment plants that the cities own and operate to be treated and delivered to households. Another piece here that I'll highlight is the CAP or Central Arizona Project Canal that you can see coming from the Northwest and kind of cutting through right past Red Mountain and then down towards the Southeast towards Pinal County and in Tucson. Um, the Central Arizona Project is operated, operated by a different entity than SRP, but it's also a federal reclamation project. So um, again, uh, the importance of partnership here is that the federal government actually owns both of these reclamation projects, the CAP and the SRP. They were authorized by Congress, constructed by the federal government, but they're now both operated by local uh, governmental entities in the Central Arizona Water Conservation District and the Salt River Project Agricultural Improvement and Power District uh, most of you know as SRP. Um, and so these two important pieces of federal investment have really enabled uh, the growth and reliability of supplies. And specifically, one really important uh, part of that diversity and, and reliability comes right at Red Mountain, where the CAP crosses the SRP. We actually have an interconnection. So we're able to take water out of the CAP that's coming from the Colorado River and put it into our canals to make deliveries throughout our service area and to those water treatment plants, especially, that can then be moved what we call off project or to the lands outside of our yellow service area. Um, so having a diversity in SRP's portfolio between the two river systems is really critical, um, but having that Colorado River supply that's interconnected with our system um, and provided to the cities that also receive SRP water is really critical because when we see drought um, and shortages on the SRP, that doesn't necessarily mean we're seeing that on the Colorado River and vice versa. So it really enables us to have that diverse portfolio. When you bring in that groundwater component that's under our feet in the aquifer, that again enhances that diversity of the portfolio, which really um, enhances that reliability. So moving towards storage. So I mentioned the other key component of, of reliability is storage. And the reason for that is getting back to that sort of feast or famine or that drought and flood cycle that I was talking about that the settlers were having such trouble with back in the late 1800s is that what we see in Arizona and this last year has been a great example is we see 
very short periods of time, often months, where we see uh, maybe several years worth of runoff come just in a couple month period. And then we might not see any significant amount of rain or snowfall for weeks, months, even years at times. And so having the infrastructure to actually capture that runoff when it's um, coming off of the watersheds is really critical to capture it and store it for delivery during the dry times. And that's exactly what SRP's uh, storage facilities are set up to do. So as I mentioned, we have uh, seven reservoirs in total, one up on the Mogollon Rim called CC Cragen, uh, two on the Verde River, and I'll be focusing on these two reservoirs most closely today, Bartlett Dam and Horseshoe Dam. And then we have four on the Salt River, Stewart Mountain, Mormon Flat, Horse Mesa, and Roosevelt Dam uh, that create Saguaro, Canyon, Apache, and Roosevelt Lakes. And many of you may have been to our, Rose to our reservoirs and recreated, um, but even if you haven't, you've probably drink in water from one of these reservoirs without even knowing it. Um, one thing I'll point out here is our total conservation storage space, which is the, the blue areas you see on this graphic. That's the area within the reservoir that we're able to capture and hold water year over year is 2.3 million acre feet of total conservation storage. Um, so I'll pause for a second. Um, an acre foot of water is about 325,000 gallons of water. It's about enough water to serve three average size households for a year. Um, and it's about a, enough water to cover a football field, end zone to end zone, one foot deep. So it's a lot of water I'm talking about. Um, but just that jargon, the acre foot, that's how much we're, of water I'm talking about. And our system has 2.3 million acre feet of capacity. Um, SRP delivers annually to our customers, to our uh, municipal water providers, to our agricultural users, to our urban irrigators, about 750,000 acre feet of water. So we have more than three times the annual carryover capacity in our reservoir system or supply than our annual demand. And so this really lends itself well to, to reliability in that last year we were able to fill our reservoirs and though we've had a very dry and concerning uh, summer, fall and early uh, winter and spring runoff season, we're not, uh, we're not so worried that we're gonna run out of water because we have a robust fill in our reservoir system last year. And that's exactly where reliability comes from. One piece um, that's, uh, that's a little bit unique about our system is the imbalance of total storage between the Salt and Verde rivers. So our total system has 2.3 million acre feet of capacity, but the Verde system only has about 276,000 acre feet compared to the Salt system, which is about 2 million acre feet of storage. Um, so one thing to point out is the, the Verde system produces about 40% of our supply and the Salt produces about 60% but we have about 10 times the storage capacity on the salt than the Verde. Um, and this is something that comes really uh, critical into our long-term planning because that smaller storage capacity on the Verde means we end up spilling a lot of water over those dams and just into the dry salt riverbed downstream and forego the opportunity to store and um, manage that water for future use. So that's something that our system is already inherently um, uh, challenged by, but one specific issue that we're seeing on the Verde that's really causing concern is sediment accumulation. Um, this is a natural phenomenon in, in Western rivers and rivers in general. You see mud and sediment transported through the, the river, and if you have a reservoir, you end up capturing that sediment in the reservoir. Uh, that's the first time the river really slows down and the sediment has a chance to really uh, slow and settle out. And so we see in our upper reservoirs, Roosevelt and Horseshoe, that um, sediment's accumulating. But at Horseshoe, the upper reservoir on the Verde, it's especially concerning because it's such a small reservoir. Um, and this graphic here really kind of puts the, the challenge into perspective. When Horseshoe was constructed back in 1950, we had 144,000 acre feet of capacity. As of 2012, we only had 98,000 acre feet of capacity. We'd lost about 46,000 acre feet of capacity to sedimentation. And so just to give you an idea of the scale of this problem, you can see right at the dam, it's about 25 to 35 feet tall of sediment accumulated. You can see our bucket truck is just a size comparison with a, with a human about six feet tall right here. And then it really grows as you go up into the reservoir. And so we, we've directly offset our ability to store and carry over water 
by storing and carrying over sediment. And this is a real challenge as we're looking to the future where we see climate change um, inducing sort of bigger swings in already a very flashy system. Uh, more severe droughts, bigger flood events, um, carryover storage is gonna be very critical to managing through those variabilities. Um, so what are we doing about this? So I, I don't like to just end on the problem. I wanna talk about what the solutions that we're looking at. And this is going to sort of the partnership piece. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the Federal Bureau of Reclamation as part of the Department of Interior owns all of SRP's dams, reservoirs, and canals. SRP is the, the operating partner for these facilities on behalf of the federal government. So as we're looking to solutions to solve this problem, we can't go in at it alone. Uh, we, we partner with the Bureau of Reclamation. We've had a contract and strong partnership with the Bureau of Reclamation um, since the early 1900s. And so it's just only natural that we would work with them. And so what we've done in the last year is embarked on what's called an appraisal study. And this is a federal planning study that says, here's the problem. We've lost 46,000 acre feet of capacity um, in horseshoe to sediment. What are the solutions that we could implement to resolve this issue? And so there's kind of three main buckets that of options that we've been looking at with a diverse stakeholder group led by the Bureau of Reclamation. We have more than 70 uh, organizations with nearly 200 individuals participating, sharing their opinions, their concerns. Um, this group includes everyone under the sun from uh, the economic development community to the uh, environmental NGOs, water managers, uh, land management agencies, resource management agencies. Um, and we're really looking at what's the best solution to solve this problem and what are the pros and cons of each. So the three main uh, themes are mechanical removing uh, or dredging of sediment. So basically, can we dig our way out of this problem? There's sediment. We have technology to remove mud and sediment. Can we just dredge it out? Um, modification of existing surface water facilities. So um, that's basically, if we can't dig our way out of the problem, can we build our way up to restore capacity? And then the last piece is upland sediment management, uh, which is really, are there activities such as reducing the risk of catastrophic wildfire to reduce the amount of sediment that we see in the Verde system, um, not to restore capacity, to, but to slow lost capacity in the future? Um, there's a lot of talks about all of these, the pros and cons, but the piece I wanna to talk to you about today is the piece that SRP has been putting a lot of research in and what we really think is the best solution. Um, and we're using this stakeholder process to really vet it. Um, this solution is really re-operating the Verde system in totality. So right now, as I mentioned before, we have two reservoirs. We have Bartlett Dam and Reservoir, which is shown by this existing blue area. And we have Horseshoe Dam and Reservoir, which is shown by this dark, uh, this black outline of um, and the kind of shaded area. So these two reservoirs, as I mentioned uh, before, have about 276,000 acre feet of capacity as of 2012. And what we're what we've looked at is from an economic standpoint and really an impact standpoint, what seems to make the most sense is not digging the sediment out. Digging the sediment out would cost well over a billion dollars. Um, and it doesn't really create value to others. And so what we saw is when we started looking at solving this problem, if we were to, to raise either Horseshoe or Bartlett Dam to restore the capacity in a similar fashion to what was done at Roosevelt Dam back in the 1990s, uh, we would not only be able to solve our problem, but we'd also be able to create additional benefits, new water supply reliability to central Arizona, which is really key to the long-term resiliency of our water supplies, really the the backbone of economic development and economic activity in the state. And so that's where we thought this really starts to make a lot of sense. And so the two uh, options that we brought forward in this appraisal study is uh, one, raising Bartlett Dam 97 feet, and the second is raising Bartlett Dam 62 feet. So this would expand the total storage capacity of the system from 276,000 acre feet to between 422,000 and 628,000 acre feet. And what we would do is actually move storage out of Horseshoe and reoperate Horseshoe as a sediment trap and a flood control structure, um, a fish barrier to prevent non-native fish from swimming upstream and restore the habitat within the reservoir to a more natural riparian habitat. And then use Horseshoe in the footprint that you see in orange, that 97 foot raise would create this reservoir that's highlighted in orange as the only reservoir on the system. Um, 
where it really started to make a lot of sense from us when we looked at the cost and the impact standpoint is we'd be able to capture current, currently spilled water that, as I mentioned before, spills over granite reef and sort of uh, dries out or evaporates as it runs downstream um, with minimal opportunity to use it and capture it and really look at how we get it to the best uses in central Arizona. This is especially critical as we're on the cusp of looking at shortages on the Colorado River, as we're looking at climate change impacts to, to existing uh, water supplies, we really uh, want to be looking at how we best manage the supplies that are coming down to the valley on the Verde River. Um, so my second to last slide is back to what you've already seen, but one critical piece that's important to show is, in general, the water supplies that come from the Salt and Verde Rivers can only be delivered legally to the yellow lands that are highlighted here. Uh, Arizona water law um, follows a prior appropriation doctrine, which is first in time, first in right. So the first people to come and put to use a water supply for beneficial uses and state claim to that have the right to use that water in perpetuity. That's a, sort of a, a very brief and high level summary, but that's the general idea. Um, this new supply that we're talking about, that additional storage capacity would not be limited to these yellow lands. And so that's where we see this really important economic development opportunity and water supply reliability piece is that this additional capacity that could be um, created on the Verde to capture those excess flows could be used throughout central Arizona. And whether that's to offset Colorado River shortages that, that may happen in the future, or it's to get new renewable supplies to communities, especially those sort of outward lying communities in the metro area that don't have consistent renewable supplies like surface water from the Salton Verde or from the Colorado River. And this is really important from our perspective from an economic development standpoint. And it's not because we're concerned with our own water supplies, right? We, we're very confident in our ability to manage our supplies with restored capacity, but it's really about the, the perceptions of Arizona's future. And if one community has an unreliable supply, and that's getting reported in the New York Times that they're running out of water, their, their wells are uh, running dry, they're unsustainable, that reflects poorly on the entire region. And so we see this as a really critical economic development opportunity to help ensure that the region has the water supplies needed so we don't get that bad press, those misconceptions that make it seem like uh, kind of the obvious easy uh, argument if you're not familiar with Arizona water is how the heck do people live in Phoenix? It's so hot and dry. And the answer is we have really robust infrastructure. We have diversity of supply and we manage our water supplies very carefully. Of course, that's not as exciting of a story, um, but that's a good thing. And in, in, in water management, not exciting is a good thing. So that's how we want to keep it by looking out long game, looking at what infrastructure and supplies we need for the next century. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing with this project. So I'll finish on this slide. Um, just very simply, this is a long term process. And as I mentioned, we're early on in a federal planning process where we're looking at all the options. That appraisal study is expected to be done by the end of this year. If there's an alternative like Bartlett Dam modification that looks viable, that warrants more study, we would go into a feasibility study, which is what's used to make a recommendation to Congress on what new infrastructure should be built on a federal reclamation project. That's another two to four years. We would then need congressional authorization, which has happened for all of our dams and reservoirs. Um, and Congress would say, go forth and build this. This is needed and Congress blesses this. Bureau of Reclamation do this. And then construction would be another five to 10 years. So this is really a long-term uh, planning process. Again, it's critical that we have these conversations now when we're in a good position for water management, um, because in order to build something like this, we have to be planning 10 to 15 years out at minimum. So with that, I'll, I'll see if there's any questions, but again, I'll leave you with reliability, partnership and investment, three of the most critical aspects of reliable water supply management in Arizona. Thank you so much, Ron. That was a very insightful presentation for a very complex topic. So it was very enjoyable. And uh, we do have a question here. Uh, does SRP have pending projects that align with Environmental Infrastructure Assistance Act, HR 2206, as it provides resources for communities to use um, to meet their water infrastructure needs? Communities to meet their water infrastructure needs. There you go. Okay, you know, I, 
unfortunately, I, I can't answer it directly because I'm not as as familiar with the specific authorities provided under that act. Um, so it might be something that Helen and I could follow up with you after um, once I can do a little bit of research on that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll do that. And we'll get back to that person asking. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. If there's any other, uh, any additional questions from anybody else, uh, feel free to send them over and we'll discuss and provide the uh, responses as soon as we can. Thank you, Ron. And next, we are going to uh, welcome some of our elected officials. I'll first welcome um, Chandler uh, Council Member Matt Orlando for an update. Good morning. How are you? How's everyone? Doing good. Thank you for joining us. All right. Now we got our uh, thing here. Um, yeah, uh, good stuff's happening in Chandler. In fact, this piggybacks right on what we talked about earlier with Garrett Taylor. Um, we just started our second budget review uh, last night. Um, our uh, revenue is at 5.6% year over year. Now, again, this is February, which was part prior to the COVID shutdown and, and activities. Uh, which is about a seven million dollars above our budget from last year. So there's still some robust economy happening in Chandler. Um, our expenditures are down and are a little down, but and flat in some respects. Uh, other exciting news or good news for us is the holiday sales are up 14 percent year over year as well. So again, we're thriving in an environment that um, in, intuitively says you shouldn't be thriving. Uh, so that's some good news, and I think that's some of the things that the council's done over the years, as well as the care dollars and the PPE and some of the activities to help keep our supporting our businesses and keeping employment going on. Uh, as you know, we have a bond election coming up. Uh, we expect a final report from former Mayor uh, Boyd Dunn in the next couple of weeks, and then uh, go out through the stakeholders in our community and get their input on the bond activity. So it'll be an open, transparent process. If all is successful, which I don't believe it, it there should be any issues, we'll probably it'll be on the November ballot. So again, more information on that as we get closer to those activities. Our activity is uh, again good metrics or indicators of what's going on in Chandler. If you look at our business registration data, uh, we've uh, closed 213 businesses in Chandler. Uh, but on the positive side, we've actually re-registered newly opened business as 597 for 384 net gain in businesses in Chandler. And those are small business, large business. Uh, some of that includes LLC transfers. But again, the whole idea of the fact that we've actually gained businesses, our sales are up, and, and we're doing an extremely robust economy here. Um, and finally, um, and, we, and we'll talk more about this, uh, Marsha Weeks, for those of you who don't know, our city manager, uh, she announced her retirement earlier this month. She'll be leaving the city, uh, retiring from the city on March 4th. We've uh, placed an interim, uh, Josh Wright, uh, in, in place, and we are doing a nationwide search for uh, a new city manager. So again, more of that to come as we uh, uh, expand that project. But definitely want a lot of input, particularly from the business community, on what we're looking for for a business city a manager and obviously uh, trying to get the business involved with the selection process. A lot of stuff happening here, so. Thank you, Councilman Orlando, um, and good update. We're gonna follow with a Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, Supervisor Jack Seller, please. Thank you. Oh, good morning. Well, let me just start by saying those of you that know me, uh, and most of you do, uh, know that, and particularly if you watched any of my, my speech when I became chairman of the Board of Supervisors, that my primary focus for my agenda for this year is still around attracting quality employers and retaining quality employers. And to do that, we need to pay attention to what lifestyle attracts these businesses and people to want to be here. Uh, so that's really what I hope to be my main focus for this year as chairman. Uh, but I think all of you also know that we are going through some challenges right now on the election process. Um, 
And, you know, the, the other part of, of trying to, to do what's right for our business environment is managing the, the COVID pandemic and working on things to get people back to school and back to work as quickly as possible. Uh, and, and, you know, that's another thing that I really feel like uh, I need to be spending even more time on than I am. Although we are, we really uh, are working that hard as well. But, but to talk about the election things that are going on right now, uh, I think that it's important to, uh, to mention that, you know, when we went through this election cycle this last year, uh, it was a very challenging time because of the pandemic and to have a fair, efficient and safe election uh, became a real challenge. But through that whole process, uh, we always, and in fact, you know, anytime there was a question in my mind, we would have executive session meetings to talk about how can we accomplish what we need to accomplish to keep this safe and fair and efficient and stay within the laws that have been established by our legislature. And we have done that every step of the way. Uh, so, but now when we start being challenged on, on the outcome, uh, you know, my focus has still been, we've done everything we could do. Uh, you know, you can't change the rules just because you don't like the outcome of an election. And one of the things you realize when you accept the responsibility for running an election is that you're not representing a party or an individual, you're representing all the voters. And you need to ensure that you really do everything with that perspective. So, uh, you know, and, and to, the, uh, to the end of, of me wanting to get back to an ordinary level of business and doing the things that are important for my agenda, you know, I have continually uh, met with leadership at both houses, uh, the Senate and the, and the legislature to tell them that we want to partner with them on working through the issues, whatever the issues are, uh, to get them resolved. Um, and in fact, I've had you know private meetings with the leadership uh, in, in both the legislature and the Senate, uh, and, and over and over again expressed my desire to work through things as partners to, to try to make things happen. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, some, some people that feel that we, because we aren't willing to change the way we did things, uh, are now challenging their authority. And uh, in fact, uh, as of this week, uh, I, I believe the Senate was voted on holding us in contempt and having several people posting that they thought we needed to be arrested. Uh, fortunately, for at least the time being, we've escaped that. But uh, it's an interesting time, and I'm anxious to get back to the real work of the county. Any questions or comments for me? Thank you, Supervisor Sellers. Um, let me check if there's any questions here in the box. But thank you for that insightful update as well. I really hope that you can get back to work and do your thing soon <laughs> and everything. Um, this is history afterwards. Um, all right. I don't have any questions right now. And uh, I'll just take a moment to thank uh, all of our panelists today for joining us on this uh, public policy meeting. We're going to be having our next one on March uh, 12th, Friday, March 12th. So please save the date for uh, more interesting topics to be discussed. We're gonna be sharing the agenda later on. And uh, for the time being, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>